So whatever was in the headlines this summer was largely a disguise for the most important thing. And that is that we had the hottest month in the history of recorded temperature. This year is on track to be the hottest year in the history of recorded temperature, and the eight hottest years are the last eight years. Last summer, this stone emerged from the River Elba in Europe during a severe drought. And it bears an, an inscription from 500 years ago during times of extreme drought and accompanying famine. And it says, if you see this stone, cry. As an inventor and as an entrepreneur, I think a lot about the asymmetry that can exist between the way we experience the present and the way we look back on our decisions from the future. In the present, it can be really tempting to let trends prevail. And if others are shrugging their shoulders against or towards climate change, for us to do the same. When we look back, it is often the times when we defied trends that we are most proud of. In the present, challenges are difficult. And we sometimes wish that our, our lives were easier. When we look back, it is the times when we are challenged that are the most fulfilling and rewarding moments of our life and the ones that actually reveal who we are. We are not on a path to hand off a climate and a civilization to our kids that they deserve. And there is no version of a sustainable civilization without a sustainable food system. And while agriculture is sometimes out of sight, out of mind, until we jump on a plane and look down and realize that it covers half the habitable globe, and about a billion people are involved in being stewards for our food system, um, it has the potential to be an enormous lever for combating the future we have in front of us. Now, um, while agriculture and the immensity of it can seem daunting, it has some material advantages that every other source of gigaton scale emissions lacks. All of those other industries require trillions of dollars of technology reinvention and rollout, whereas agriculture has this beautiful forever young aspect to it, where its annual emissions are largely entrained in the decisions that growers are making that year. And therefore, those decisions could change next year if we provide the right incentives. So that forever young attribute is, is pretty simple. It's based on the fact that a quadrillion seeds are planted around the globe every year. And the decisions that growers make on each field that comprises our food system determines whether that field is a carbon emission technology or a carbon capture technology. Now, it may sound funny to consider agriculture as a carbon capture technology, since today it is a gigaton scale source of emissions. But of course, the only reason those quadrillion seeds become bigger than wet seeds is that they unfold this amazing technology over time that allows it to utilize the sun's energy, capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, rip oxygen off of it, and build themselves from those atoms. And if you stroll through a cornfield, every pound of green that you see comes from about a pound of carbon dioxide that those plants pulled out of the sky to build themselves from. And, and of course, it doesn't stop at the green. They build elaborate root structures underground, and plants pour carbon into the soils around them. That is a sort of quid pro quo for the microbial communities that are protecting the plant, giving it access to nutrients, and in exchange, the plants are feeding them. Now, depending on the decisions that are made above that ground, that rich soil and source of carbon can either be depleted over time or it can accrue carbon from CO2 in the atmosphere over time. And we already have a perspective on some relatively straightforward levers that can drive CO2 into the soil carbon pool. These are just the very, very beginning. But it's apparent that if you plant cover crops, which is a, plant you plant, a crop that you plant in the fall so that there's photosynthesis and living roots in the soil year round, if you shift from tilling practices to no-till, if you increase the diversification of your crops, and if you alter your nutrient management and in rice, your irrigation management, you can go from potentially being a one ton per acre annually CO2 emitter 
to having every acre capture a ton of CO2 from the atmosphere and store it over time. However, it's not that simple. It's not a one-size-fits-all, and if you do the bare minimum of these haphazardly, you don't accrue that benefit. In fact, you can do this while accruing no benefit or, in fact, worsening your emission profiles. And we have a, for a fork in the road in front of us right now that isn't in the news, but it is going to affect the food system that we enjoy and that we hand off to our kids. And that is the way that we incentivize practices like these to be adopted in farming. The easy way to do this is garnering a lot of traction from big companies, from governments, and it's understandable that the easy way is to simply check a box next to these activities and say, yep, if you did these, then you get a reward. But of course, we should be skeptical of every easy solution that sits in front of us when it comes to climate change. And this one is no exception. Instead, if we reward and measure what matters, which is not an activity, but it is the yield of carbon that a grower is capable and actually achieves capturing in their soils, and the quantitative reduction of emissions that they achieve by changing their practices. If we reward that, I'd argue we may get the food system that we want and that our kids deserve. We didn't land on the moon by putting incentives on a rocket launch. You land on the moon by committing to the outcome that you want to achieve. This didn't happen by rewarding the planting of seeds. I mean, rewarding yield is, of course, as old as agriculture itself. And the marshalling of human ingenuity to maximizing yield and harvests when incentives are built around harvests is extraordinary. So, of course, this is hard. The, the easy way is, is rarely going to be the way that achieves what we really want. I'm proud of being a founder of a company where hundreds of people in our company have spent several years trying to make this as easy as possible. We'd, we'd rather the difficulty be on our backs than on a grower needing to pull together the worst tax return type process that they could imagine with hundreds of hours of data collection over the past several years of farming so as to justify the benefits of a change that they've made. But we've built methodologies that stand upon decades of academic research so that that can be done in a straightforward fashion. Now, modeling carbon flows and putting a carbon mass balance on every, feed in ag every field in agriculture is not easy but it's really important to do this. If we don't do this, we won't get rewards structured around the outcomes that we really want. So this isn't theoretical. We've, we've had our first two harvests of carbon credits going to growers, thus far sequestering 133,000 tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and reducing it in the emissions of their operations. These are growers on about 400,000 acres of land in the United States which is one one-thousandth of U.S. row crop agriculture. So this is not theoretical. Like This is ready to scale now if we put the incentives on what matters. If you scale this to U.S. agriculture, that would be 100 million metric tons of CO2 captured annually from the atmosphere. If you scaled it to the globe, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that four gigatons of carbon dioxide could be captured every single year. And that's with what we know right now. That's the Teosinte ancient corn equivalent. What happens if you have a billion people inventing new harvest and yield solutions for maximizing the role that agriculture can play in carbon capture? But this is all going to come down to what incentives we place here. The beautiful thing about agriculture is that despite, amidst its immensity, with billions of people stewarding the food system that we enjoy, every single one of those farms has a farmer. 
And that is an individual who is often navigating very tenuous economic challenges and making decisions to be good stewards of their land. Farmers are ready to be the heroes of carbon capture and agriculture. We need to give them the tools to do that. Thank you very much.